that you all have an opportunity to walk around this building because it's really a culmination of all of the years that there has been a library in the Hill District because there has been one for over 100 years. Okay. So this is just the third in the line, but we're still here. And I think that that's the main thing about the longevity of libraries and the dedication of the folks in this room and all the people who made that possible. Um, a couple of just basic little logistic things. If you need to leave the room, <laughs> the facilities are down the, the aisleway right here. There's a big mirror on the wall, and you'll see it there. And there's also a water fountain. I hope that when you leave, you will also, in your traveling through this building, go to what we call the living room, which is the front room that has the August Wilson map in it from 1923. And it shows some of what the hill looked like then. Some of that stuff is still here, but some of it is gone. But it is a legacy to this community. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne, who I think has some things to say, and then we're going to listen to Miss Hewitt talk about what it was like <laughs> to be the first African-American librarian in the Carnegie Library System. Thank you. And her history with SLA. Yes. Let me get mine.
I'm so happy. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's wonderful out here. I am so pleased to be here, and I'm so glad that I met Susan and that, that we had this exchange. And, that, and she's a real go-getter, you know. She just took the ball and went with it. So here I am. Uh, it will be a rambling speech for some <laughs> None of you or few of you were born in 1944 when I graduated from Carnegie Library. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a one, I, I will be 90 years old in February. <laughs> my son that I am going to tape record my memoirs and it's going to be fun. I had a wonderful time in Pittsburgh. It was the making of me and prepared me for living in New York. But I want to go back and tell you how it was then and how it is now. Uh, and how I became a librarian, I, I had an older sister whose health wasn't very good, and um, uh, she would always give me a list of books and send me to the library <laughs> to pick out things for her. And I, I grew up in Newcastle, so I, she, she was seven years older than I, and, uh, and I was very precocious because I began to read very early, and I would read the things that she read. I had a, uh, had a children's card and I went to story hours and then I, would, then I got so that I could select books for, for Dorothy and it was Jean Stratton Porter and you know uh, all, all of those that, that are history makers. Uh, so like, and, and, and my girlfriend and I had roller top desks and we had our own library. We, we loaned books to our child, childhood friends, you know, so it was in the genes and then the bones early on to become a librarian. I, I went to Geneva College in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, and worked in the library the, all, the whole four years that I was there. And a girlfriend of mine married an Urban League executive, and, and they were having their uh, national conference at the James Weldon Johnson camp nearby here. There. You did? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and he invited me to go along with her. We were the youngest kid of people there. He invited me to be company for her. And uh, we were sitting on the, on the grass listening to speeches. And Maurice Moss, who was the then executive director of the Urban League here in Pittsburgh, uh, talked to us. And he said to me, he said, well, uh, what are you go where, where are you in school? And I said, Geneva College. And he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm here to decide whether to be a social worker or a librarian. He said, we do not, we have every profession represented by a black person in Pittsburgh, but we do not have a librarian. Why don't you apply to Carnegie Library School and see what happens? What are your grades like? I said, I'm an honor student. He said, apply, and if they don't accept you, we'll go to bat for you. So I came down from Newcastle, and I had my interview with Ralph Munn, the then director, and I walked out walking on air because I had been assured that I would have a job when I graduated working at, Car at the Wiley Avenue branch of Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. But one of the things that disturbed me in that interview was he said to me, I am sorry that you do not look more like a Negro than you do so that when anybody walked into the library, they would know exactly what you were. Well, well, you have to think of the times and, and, and the times. This is 60 years ago. 
And uh, I always refer to Pittsburgh as way down south up north. <laughs> <laughs> and it truly was. It really was because we didn't eat in, in the, the restaurants downtown or Coughlin's or Isley's or any of the, the dumps or, or, you know, we, we, it was a truly segregated world. But anyhow, I found out later that I was the only, the second librarian enrolled in Carnegie Library School at the time. There had been a 20 year gap between the graduation of Florence Proctor Howell and my admittance to the library school in 1943. Now these were the war years and some of the librarians were going to uh, army libraries and so forth. I learned later on, several years later, there were two Jewish girls who were admitted to the library school and one of them was hired at Carnegie Mellon at Carnegie Institute Technology Library. And the other one said to me, and she's my lifelong friend, she's in New York. Helen said to me a couple of years later, she said, Vivi, if it hadn't been the war years, I doubt seriously that Ruth and I and you would have been admitted to the library school. There was a shortage of librarians. And when we graduated, she was told, Helen was told, you would be more comfortable and happier seeking employment uh, in New York City where there are more of your kind. These, these were words that, 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 uh, that happened, that, that we had to endure. I, to prepare the public for my being in the library, and because there was a shortage of librarians, those of us uh, in library school uh, worked 15 hours a, a week. And um, so I worked 15 hours a week at, uh, at, at the library. And um, because I had worked in the Carnegie Library System when it came time to do practice work, I wasn't placed in another library in the system. So it was suggested that I go to New York City to do my library work, okay, my practice work. Well, I, I you know, small town girl, greens, grass, and everything, but fortunately, one of the women who came uh, to work at the YWCA while her husband was overseas in the Army became my very best friend. And she had lived in Englewood, New Jersey, and she said, Vivi, I'm not going to let you go to New York alone. I'm going with you. So we went up on the train, <laughs> and she taught me how to ride the subway, how to do this, and that took me to my first Broadway play. I had people who were very protective of me and who looked out for me, because I looked like a little wee kid anyhow. <laughs> 90 pounds, five feet tall. And but anyhow, I did my practice work in New York City, which was wonderful. They were my first role models. Dorothy Homer at 135th Street Branch Library and the Schomburg Library where Dr. Lawrence Reddick was. And New York sent me all over the city so that I would have experience with the, at the Nathan Strauss Library where the young people were in the, in, in the uh, at the main library in Spanish Harlem. I had a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I came back and uh, graduated and, and, and uh, started working without fanfare, without fanfare at uh, Carnegie Library. And even so, to show you what the system and what the tenor of the times was I had some friends who came into the library who ignored me because they thought that I that I was passing. Can you believe it? They, they, oh. 
just believed in a black library. We weren't called black then. We were called Negroes or colored. You know, they didn't believe. And then one time when I was working in the library, I was sitting there typing, and a little girl, a little five-year-old girl came up to me, and I never forget this. She said, Miss, is you colored or is you white? And I was shocked, and she answered her own question. She said, oh, you must be white, because I can tell by your fingernails. <laughs> and I have nail polish on. So, <laughs> you know, you had to deal with those, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Carnegie Library was, was uh, very formal, uh, very tough, very good. And there were only 18 of us in the, in the class. And five of those women are my lifelong friends. They're living, and we've had reunions, and we see each other. My colleagues were very, very, my, my library school companions were very good. If we'd go to a restaurant on Forbes Street, and the, and the black cook came out to look, you know, you know, you know, and if they wouldn't serve me, they'd walk out with me. We wouldn't leave there, you know. I had experience of racism in, in the city that I had to contend with and go to school and do my work, you know, and be calm on the outside, but churning on the inside, dealing with all these kinds of things. Um, but I had a wonderful, wonderful time because the black social workers and the black professional workers in the city of Pittsburgh were in my corner. I had to succeed. I had to be successful. They knew and I knew that depended on me, depended where any other black person would be admitted to the library school, number one, and number two, be employed by Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Wendell Ray was the first black male who was employed and the first one who was employed at the main library, you know, so, yeah, way down south, up north. And Ralph Muff was very paternalistic, and, uh, and I don't know if any beginning librarian ever had the head of personnel, the head of the main library, and the director of the library appear when she was giving a book review to a high school group. But they did, you know, because I was, you know, I was being tried and tested every time. And my life was 24-7, 24-7, because there was a very slim demarcation line between my personal life and my private life. And I could not do anything that reflected uh, on, in a bad way, negative way, on Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, because I was, you know, the black Carnegie Library, okay. Um, but I was kind of subversive and a maverick. <laughs> <laughs> and I belonged to the Pittsburgh Interracial Action Council and the priest at one of the Episcopal churches and a couple of professors from Pitts University of Pittsburgh Sherman Harmon, who was the Boys Work Secretary at Center Avenue YMCA, Rose McCurgy, who was East Indian, and a lot of us belong, were, and, uh, belonged to this, and some of the librarians from Wiley Avenue Branch Library. And uh, so uh, we won eyes leaves on, um, uh, in East Liberty. You know, you couldn't eat it honestly. So Fred Holmes and one other guy and I, we, we decided we were gonna eat it honestly. So I sat between these two guys and we weren't waited on, we weren't waited on. I learned after that if I was going to go on a sit-in that I would have something to eat before I went. <laughs> <laughs> but I did that quietly, but didn't want, it wanted to, almost secretively, didn't want it to reflect on the, on the endowment. So it was a very, very difficult kind of thing to do. But as I say, I lived with um, uh, Nancy Lee, who was a preeminent black social worker 
in, in, in Pittsburgh, who is very, very wonderful to me and, and very helpful to me in so many ways, and Orlean Rico, who was very prominent in the city. And so I had the good people looking out for me, Dr. and Mrs. Cuffer, Judge Homer Brown and Mrs. Brown, and people like that. So, so it was wonderful. But, and, then, and as I say, some of the memories were bittersweet. One of the most bittersweet one was uh, when I worked at Wiley Avenue uh, and was in school. The transfer point was at Craig Street and Center Avenue. And there was a restaurant there. And I would go to class and I would go in there and have my dinner and then get on the streetcar and go to work. And one evening I was there uh, having my dinner and I noticed this white couple looking daggers at me. And when they paid their bill, they complained to the uh, uh, owner. And when I went to pay my bill, he asked me not to come into the restaurant anymore. And the war was going on, you know. Well, you, you, I'm an Aquarian, a Debbie Christian. You never know what you're gonna do or how you're gonna respond. And so I went ballistic. I really let him have it. I said, our guys are in the war fighting for the likes of you and for the like of them. How dare they keep me out of here, you know. And there was a professor from the University of Pittsburgh standing behind me, and he said, I would object if you didn't serve her. You know, so what did I do? I went right to Sherman Harmon and told him. So then they start with tweeting that restaurant. But the worst part of it was when I went out and was standing in the aisle waiting to go to the library to work, one of the managers or someone from that restaurant came out and propositioned me. <laughs> Had I gone ballistic in the restaurant, <laughs> I grew up with with two brothers and five cousins, boys, seven seven men in the family, and they knew how to curse and swear. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the and I let him have every curse word that was in the book and every every doing the dozens on his mother. <laughs> then I got on the bus, and I had to go to the library, stand at the desk, and uh, deal with the public as though nothing had happened. A reaction sat in later on when I was over at the, the school, and I was crying, and Kate Coolidge, Kate Coolidge, yes. wonderful, had been a refugee from Hitler. And, and all it was my dear, dear friend. And Kate was very consoling and very, very wonderful to me. So I had good friends and good experiences and, and a wonderful, wonderful time in Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Uh, another incident that I remember very well was um, we were interviewed, Kate and I were interviewed for uh, 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 radio. And uh, the fellow who interviewed us um, uh, for, for the uh, segment that was to appear happened to be Jewish. That was all right. But he referred to me as a negress, which is a very insulting term. So Kate and I called him on it, so he eliminated that. So we had things to deal with. But I learned very early on as, as a very early, in my early 20s, to, to deal with, with uh, difficult situations and to keep my composure and, and um, try to see both sides and, and, and mature very, very early. But I loved working at, at Wiley Avenue Branch. It, it was so fun, much fun. Anyone as a beginning librarian should have been blessed to have had a mentor, a boss like Eugenia Bruno. Wiley was <coughs> so wonderful. And the first year, I was taught the administrative work and all of that. And then 85% of the social workers 
social work agencies operated in the Hill District. It was still a very mix. There, there were a lot of Jewish people still in the neighborhood. I, Ivy Kaufman Settlement was still very prominent. And uh, uh, we, the, the librarians, Bruno and librarians were on every committee and every in every facet of the Hill District. So you were as much social workers as you were librarians. We had Visiting Nurses Association, Hill uh, uh, K Boys Club, the YMCA, the YWCA, uh, the YMCA had <coughs> very prominent speakers from all over the world, all over New York, all over uh, the United States come and we had the uh, forum series of Alia Wild School. And after that first year of training, in the second year, Miss Bruno put me on some of the committees that she was on. And the third year, I was a full operative on many committees. So I would meet at the YMC for planning the, the programs for Alia Wild School for a Sunday afternoon. At, uh, and Jacob Lawrence, gave his immigration show at the YMCA in the 40s. That young man did it at the Carnegie Library. Uh, uh, our people came over and they just flipped over his work. But it was not critiqued or interviewed by the Post-Gazette or the Pittsburgh Press at all. They missed out on, on missed the boat. But a lot of wonderful, wonderful things happened and the library was right in the midst of all of it, all of it. Uh, we had serviced everyone from the illiterate to the refugee to the PhD candidate because we had people studying for their PhD at, uh, at uh, Pitt, University of Pittsburgh, and they would use the uh, Carnegie Wiley and the Branch Library. And I became very, very good friends to K. Leroy Irvis. And he, he, I knew that he was a good soap carver, a good artist, and he was writing books, and I would, would order books with him in mind. And one of the people who came to the library every two weeks to get books for her mother uh, was Billy Eckstein's mother. And I talked to Mrs. Eckstein on the phone. She was wonderful. I never met her, but Eileen Sawyer would come in. So there were all of those kinds of experiences that she had. And my main name is Davidson, of course. And a little old lady, tall, thin, narrow, dark lady from what's the, the projects up in the hill there. So they came down on the bus. And, and Rosemary Eisensee, who was one of the librarians, taught her to read. This was a woman who was in her six, late 60s, maybe 70s, and when she would come in with her children's book, she, it was a joy to see her. And I said, my name is Davidson, and she says, and my, I am Mandy Davidson, and I can write my name, you know. And it, it was just wonderful. And then there was a, a Jewish lady, a refugee, who wouldn't send the letter home unless I read it. And uh, it, so there, there were those kinds of experiences that that you had. And we were, uh, Miss Bruno was sort of kind of the head of the game too because we wanted to, to change the catalog uh, to, uh, instead of, you know, the integrated catalog and to often type the subject separated, and we did that. Um, and then the neighborhood began to, uh, to the, uh, we saw the master plan for the changing of redevelopment of downtown Pittsburgh, and they were beginning to relocate people out into Homewood, and Homewood was beginning to change. Homewood was the neighborhood for the elitist black people, and it was very middle class. Uh, and the Homewood 
branch library was the, the, the prime library in the whole system. And so as the neighborhood demographics began to change, uh, they decided the, that uh, the library should change. So Miss Bruno was transferred out there and to her, she, she said, I will only accept the transfer if I can take my staff with me. And that meant, she couldn't take everybody, but that meant that she took Gladys Howell and yeah, <laughs> and me uh, out to, to, to Hollywood with, with her. And Gladys was the second uh, clerical worker hired, and she worked in the children's room at Wiley Avenue Branch. And the uh, the other one, the children's library, who became very famous, was her name then was LeClaire G. Alger. But she took on her Welsh name, and uh, she wrote Jan and his wonderful uh, mouth organ. She wrote children's books and became very, very famous. And she was a character, because she lived in, in Greenwich Village and um, was, oh, she, she was, she was fun. Well, fun. <laughs> but uh, it, it was great. So I had a wonderful, wonderful time. And my library school friends were, were very wonderful. How did I have, why did I leave Pittsburgh and why? Pittsburgh at that time was a smoky city. And it was, it was at noon time, they would, you would have to have all the street lights on. It would be so dark and dirty and uh, dull. And I suffered severely from sinus. And my mom said to me, you'll never do any good as long as you live in this city. You must leave this city. Well, I wrote the, the Dermot's letters of application and refer, uh, uh, references that you have ever seen written. <laughs> I wrote two letters, three letters. I wrote to Howard University. I wrote to Tuskegee, Alabama, to the Veterans Hospital, and I wrote to Atlanta University uh, Library School. And Howard University's qualifications were one of their librarians looked so strenuous, so I couldn't thought I could never meet them, even with seven years of experience in one of the best library systems in, in, the, in the country. So I just threw the application in the wastebasket and forgot about it. Two years later, I have an SOS uh, from Atlanta University. I was on vacation. I just started my vacation. And I always regretted the way this happened. But I had to make a decision immediately. They had an opening at where, on the graduate school for a, a librarian to run the, the, the library school library <coughs> and to teach two courses in the graduate library school. And one was public libraries, okay. And the other was beginning reference, okay. <laughs> so who could turn those down? And I had to decide right on the spot, yes, no, I went down for the interview. But I was vacationing in North Carolina and they, I went down and I was hired on the spot, and I had to submit a letter of resignation immediately, which Ralph Munn took umbrage with. He said, you sound like you resigned in a fit of anger. Your, your resignation isn't, isn't accepted. It's merely tabled for you to come back here and earn the right for a, a recommendation for a position for which we think you are qualified. Okay. That letter is in my archives. <laughs> and uh, so the next time I saw Ralph Munn was at the midwinter meeting of the American Library Association in Chicago. And <coughs> red in the face. Okay. Uh, how I happened to, oh, and I was, Carnegie Library at that time was not ready for a branch librarian. 
I was being transferred out horizontally, horizontally, but never vertically. And at the time that I went on vacation, I had been transferred to the East Liberty branch. You know, it's another dark face, you know. So you, things happen, and that they sometimes happen for the best, I guess. Because the day after I got on campus, the dean of the library school, the very famous Virginia Lacey Jones, decided that that redheaded man teaching English and the humanities at Morehouse College and Miss Davidson would make a nice couple. And she said for me, the day after I got to the office, we should do that. And three months later, we were married. <laughs> wonderful 50 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. um, now, how did I happen to get into special libraries? <laughs> 18 of us in the library school, all women. And one of the women in the library school was Anne Steffi, who came from an extremely wealthy family here in Pittsburgh. She was a socialite and a debutante, and she was all of us, but not in the, in the class, but not off the class. Anne was very super sophisticated, a Smith College graduate, you know. She would come in, we would be in the classroom, and she'd come in late with her furs on, but she would sneak in and put them in the locker, you know, some, as not to be uh, intrusive, you know, that she was going off to a, to a lunch at the Shady Side Golf Club or this and that and everything. And we'd see her picture, in the society pages, post we said, or the press, or she was very nice. But she also uh, uh, was very articulate, and uh, she, of course, read the book review of the New York Times every week. We thought that she was so well read because she just read it. <laughs> <laughs> and she talked about uh, two things. And one person can influence you. Anne Steffi talked about <clears throat> ethical culture school in New York City. And she talked about special libraries association. And she said, and you pay your membership in special libraries association, and they'll help you find the job. <laughs> <laughs> and those things were buried in the back of my mind. So that when my husband and I left Atlanta, to go to his native New York City. And I stayed home two years till my son was uh, toilet trained and talking before I went back to work. And I decided that I was going to work in special libraries because even though I loved Pittsburgh and working in the public library, I didn't like working two or three nights from one to nine o'clock <laughs> and on Saturdays when everybody else is going to the football game. <laughs> so I decided that early on, several things I decided, that I would never live in a town that depended on one industry and one industry alone. Newcastle was little steel and all that, and it was a domino effect if anybody was out work. So that was one decision. And then I was working special libraries nine to five, five days a week. <laughs> <laughs> and Steffi planted the seed. So I went down to Special Libraries Association, and Miss Stebbins was the librarian, and she would match you up with, with jobs, you know. And my first job, uh, of course, from my contacts in um, at Atlanta University was with Crow College Publishing Company the first two years that I went to work. Uh, and the fashionable 50s, 645th Avenue, in the fashionable 50s when women wore hats, gloves, and you, you know, you looked like a model when you went to work. Crow College Publishing Company research where you you answered the questions that the people who owned the encyclopedia thought they couldn't find the answer to in the <laughs> encyclopedia. So we sat there batting out answers to these silly questions. <laughs> and, and it was
was production, production, production. I did it for two years, and work, I never worked so hard in all my life as I worked. But it, it, it gave me the confidence to be able to answer any question, any reference question that was thrown at me. I could, if I didn't know the answer, I knew where to find the answer or how to find the answer. So that two years there was great. So 640 Fifth Avenue was at Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street, across mm -hmm. from Best and Company, to Pena, you know, all, all the stores you can shop at on the one shop. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to, uh, went to Rockefeller's, uh, went to special libraries, and Miss Stevens gave me the, the uh, thing for Rockefeller Foundation, which was the 30 Rockefeller Plaza. And I went over and had the interview, and it was wonderful. It was hired on the spot. And there again, there again, the first African American professional woman on the staff. There were black men who were messengers and in the mail room and a couple in the treasurer's office, but the first professional person on the staff to run that library for eight years. It was wonderful. That's how I got it, the special libraries. And I became a, a deputy of special libraries. I also went on some interviews for, uh, for jobs. And New York, at, at, uh, 50, 60 years ago, wasn't clean. It was way down south, up north, too, because <laughs> I went to NBC and CBS and some of the advertising agencies, and they weren't ready for, for a dark face. They weren't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I determined to go into special libraries to make inroads into that field. To, to, and there's a missionary spirit about me, I guess. And I guess I'm here to help pave the way and to make the way for others to succeed you. So that's that's what I've been doing. The special libraries was always very, very good to me. Very good. Excuse me. stayed home for about 10 months and my friends wouldn't let me stay home. I never had to look for a job after that. My, my friend called me and asked me to do a consulting job at Catherine Gibbs School. So I took that on for two and a half years and, and worked with audio visuals and worked with the faculty 
that's not fun. And then after that, I said, enough already. <laughs> and then I was home for a couple of weeks, and somebody from the Council on Foreign Relations called me and said, we need you. And so I, you can write your own ticket and make your terms. I said, I'll work two and a half days a week. And uh, so I worked, this extended it to three, so I worked there. And uh, for two and a half years or three years. And then after that, I said to Virginia, I said, look, I'm trained as an international relations specialist. You don't have to spend two years training me. Uh, and as long as you have me doing this work, you're never going to get a full-time assistant that you need. So I'm going to quit so that you can get a full-time assistant. <laughs> Yeah. You have to make decisions like that. So I stayed home, quit. And then in the meantime, my husband's health began deteriorating. We were serious collectors of art, and uh, Bank of America came to us to buy 58 pieces of our African American art collection, and uh, uh, with the stipulation that the African-American Art Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, build the facilities to house it. And then while they were raising money to do that, Bank of America used the collection as a public relations tool and sent it to uh, cities where they had major facilities. So for the past 10 years, I've been to 30 American cities where Bank of America <laughs> had <laughs> facilities and a neat special librarian there. <laughs> and I've had a fall. Met August Wilson in Seattle, Washington. And uh, it, it's been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful life. I have had, I have three role models. Brooke Astor for her philanthropy. Etta Moten, who lived to be over 100 years old. She was the first Bess in Corby and Bess. State in Tempe uh, was working on his doctorate under Hale Woodruff, 
and I met people through him. So I got to know all of the American masters. They became friends, and we could buy their art when, when it was $150, $500, and we were really something when we reached the affluent uh, level that we could pay a thousand bucks for a painting, mm -hmm. you know, and all. But we got to know these men very well. We were pioneers because African Americans weren't collecting our masters or our. So we knew Jake. Jake lived, I live at 102nd Street, and he lived at 106th and Broadway. We got to know Jake and Gwen, Hubert Lee Smith. They all became our friends. Romeo Beard, uh, Hale Woodward, uh, John Biggers is a distant relative of mine, and Jim Rigsby, a relative. Mm -hmm. Ernie Crutchlow, we became very close friends. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a whole another level mm -hmm. of life in retirement has evolved for me. And in a way, it's been grief therapy because John died in 2000 wasn't able to travel. But I've been to Seattle, to Portland, to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, to Dallas, for, uh, to four cities in Florida, to, to uh, Atlanta, to Howard University, to uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Chicago, Detroit. You know, I've got them all. <laughs> really yes. And I am doing in retirement the things that people say they're going to do <laughs> and never get around to doing, they're either too ill to do it or too out of it and can't do it. And I wake up every morning and I say, thank you, Lord. I am vertical, mm -hmm. I am mobile, and I have my wits about it. <laughs> and I've been blessed. And the library world has been very, very good to me, very good to me. And I, been allowed to travel. I've been on every continent except uh, Antarctica and Australia, and I, I can do without it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Another question? Oh yes, and that has a Pittsburgh. Henry Henry Tanner, Henry Oswald Tanner. Bishop Tanner was the, his father was the bishop of Bethel, Big Bethel A M E Church on Wiley Avenue, which was demolished, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, bishop Tanner was born in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, Henry Oswald Tanner was born in Pittsburgh, and later, when his father was transferred to Philadelphia, grew up in Philadelphia, and because of racism at the time. Aikens suggested that he go to Paris to live and work, and he became a, an expat, and he lived in Paris. And the uh, uh, and I knew who he was, and I was reared as an AME, although when I married, I became an Episcopalian because my husband was <coughs> Episcopalian. But anyhow, I, I have a history of, of, of wanting a tanner. One hung in the Center Avenue YMCA, and I don't know what happened to it. And I don't know if Pittsburgh knew what they had or not. I don't know where it is. But anyhow, I wanted the tanner, and I went uh, to my art gallery and uh, uh, was hesitating to buy it. And while I was hesitating for a couple of days to make up my mind, it was sold. And you never, ever forget painting that you let get away from you. So I told the gallery owner, I said, if a tanner ever comes on market again, let me know, because they're very rare to come on market. Uh, 1968, there was a retrospective of tanners at the art gallery in New York City, and we were too poor and couldn't buy it, afford anything there. But for John's 50th birthday, I bought eight Tanner etchings and drawings so that he would remember his birthday. But then the receptionist at the gallery called me and said, Mrs. Hewitt, we have a Tanner. And I rushed over on my lunch hour and saw it. And I didn't hesitate. I went to 
my church's credit union and, and borrowed the money to buy it and never regretted it. And uh, the first African-American painting in the White House is a tanner bought by Hillary and Bill uh, Clinton, at Clinton. And we were invited for that, Nancy and, and Mickey Washington, and Dr. Nancy Washington here in Pittsburgh is a member of the Tanner family. Yes, so the art world has, has been wonderful, you know, and, and I've, I've mentored people not only in the library world, but in collecting one who's sitting here, Joan James. <laughs> I've mentored her and some others in, in collecting. Okay, can I just say one thing? Vivian has been more than a friend to me. She has been a mentor. Any of you <coughs> need to do a black history program like I did for Spitaly Academy. Uh, and I had met Vivian and I had the utmost respect for her. Uh, and I called her out of a clear blue sky and said, I need a black history program. I need a black artist. I need uh, a program to bring to Swiftly in the neighboring communities. And at that time, there was no August Wilson Center for me to get help. Uh, Vivian was at the utmost help. She helped me bring Warren Parks. She had his phone number. <laughs> <laughs> she helped me bring Ernie Critchlow. She helped me bring Jimmy Denmark. Uh, she helped me bring, I can't even go into how many artists she helped me and it was just, it was a revelation for Pittsburgh to be able to have that kind of thing. People came from Pittsburgh to Swickley to see my black history program because of Vivian Hewitt. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you need help with anything at this day and time, I'm sure she is still willing to help. <laughs>
and there are many, many good artists in your local community and do support yes. them. <laughs> Do it, know how to do it up right. 